All right, everybody, so we're going to get into Kingdom Animalia today. So it should be fun, should be interesting. There's a lot of info to cover, so I'm going to try and cram it all in. But check out my uh, little snippet on Canvas about like what would actually be on the test or not, because it's going to be a lot of info, and most of this stuff is not on the test, so read that. So this creature right here is one that kind of confused... Uh, kind of early scientist. It's actually, this is a sponge, but sponges are considered animals even though they don't move. So what they've done is they've dyed some material um, so you can kind of see the flow of how it actually like brings in, it's a filter fitter, it brings in food from the outside and will basically spit it all out. So we'll look at that closely. So an animal that doesn't move, but still an animal. So we'll get into that. So there's a little weekly prayer. So evolution of the animal kingdom. So how things got classified. So remember with classification, we went domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be staying in the whole animal kingdom, but we're going to be looking at different phylum. And eventually we're going to be looking at different classes and orders as well. So uh, we'll get there. But mostly we're going to stay at kind of this level, very broad categorizations. So animal phyla, there's like 36, we're only going to look at 9, um, uh, basically uh, mostly these guys right here, um, so these are kind of the big the big 9, um, and look, another cladogram right here, so hopefully you can be able to understand this, sorry it's a little fuzzy, um, but we'll, we'll get through all these and then we'll get, finish off with chordata, which would be us humans. All right, so what puts everything into the animal kingdom? So uh, you basically reproduce using gametes, sex cells, so sperm and egg. Um, the body cells are diploid. We don't have cell walls. So like uh, mushrooms, you know, they have cell walls. Plants have cell walls. Well, that sponge does not have a cell wall. Uh, mitochondrial, we're eukaryotes. We get our energy through a heterotrophic process, usually aerobic respiration. So all that stuff, you have those characteristics that would fit you into the animal kingdom. And that's like basically what you would need to know for the test. So pretty short and easy. But let's get into it. So we're going to start with very basic animals. So this is our sponges. I'm going to wrap all the way around to get to the more advanced animals, so crudata or things with backbones. So we'll get there. This is going to be like a two-parter. So speaking of backbones, things, uh, animals can be invertebrates or vertebrates. So if you're an invertebrate, you do not have a backbone. And if you're a vertebrate, yeah, you have some kind of spinal uh, column and your uh, basically spinal cord is inside there. So the nerve cord is kind of surrounded by this kind of like a bony structure. Um, so invertebrates will still have that um, nerve cord. It just won't be wrapped in a spine. So again... Where's the nerve cord and what's it wrapped in? So uh, sponges, we're going to start off, this is an invertebrate. They actually don't really have a nervous system, which is really funky. It's uh, very basic. They're aquatic, mostly marine. There are some freshwater sponges out there, and their body is covered with pores, so that's where the periphery comes from. But multicellular, right? They are in the animal kingdom, so they're made of multiple cells. So we'll go a little... Fast. They can have lots of different type of body plans. That's what symmetry means. Are they asymmetrical or radiosymmetrical? So could you cut them and they'd be in a perfect uh, bilateral symmetry? Or would they have many types of symmetry? Kind of like a, a wheel. You can cut a wheel in any different ways and each side would look the same. Um, they can actually, um, they can bud. So they're kind of like this weird kind of in-between. They can do sexual and asexual reproduction, kind of like a plant. Um, but sexual is kind of the best, right? Because you increase your genetic diversity, increase survival here. All right, so sponges don't really have a... Um, Skeleton, right? Um, but what they do have is a skeleton-like structure for support since they don't have like cell walls or anything like that. How do they stand upright? And if you zoom way in, they have what are uh, these little spicules or what they're called, calcium carbonate, silicon, collagen, different types of material that will make these structures that help build and give support to the sponge. How they feed, though, is really interesting. So these pores, they call them coanocytes or collar cells. They've got the flagella little whip. So here's some motion. Even though you don't really see a sponge moving, we do get some motion. We also get motion in the sperm, too, right? So it's a very similar apparatus, right? Sperm have flagella. So they just whip, and they basically will suck food into the collar, and they will digest it, and then um, sponges will, like, spit it back out. Um, so it will be kind of in one way and out the same way, or kind of like what we saw before, it'll come into the side and then they'll like, kind of like excrete the waste out the kind of like top of the sponge. Um, so phagocytosis is how they um, 
digest their food. So body plans, you can kind of see an evolution of complexity, right? So you're getting more and more complexity. So here's the kind of water coming in and spitting it out. Um, if it's coming in this way, though, it has to take more time. So that's kind of the point of having all these invaginations is as you, uh, if the water is slower, it has to take more time getting through this kind of quote unquote digestive system. That's more opportunity for the sponge to actually pick out and get food, um, it kind of slows it all down. So you can kind of see maybe early forms, early uh, an early evolution of sponges, and then the kind of later, more evolved evolution of sponges. It's all about surface area. And they will filter a ton of water. Look at that, 1,500 liters a day. But they're very basic animals, right? They don't really have a respiratory, excretory system. It's kind of like right at the cell level, in and outs, and not really a nervous system either. So we'll start to add on these things as we move up the tree of life. All right, so one file it down. So this is optional if you want to watch it. Check it out. Most of the videos I'm going to show you are going to be optional this go around. Um, so sponges, you might think, look a lot like coral. And they do, but they are actually have some different, uh, pretty significant differences. So we're going to move on up. We're going to go from sponges to then darians. So this is where coral would be. Um, so developing tissues. Instead of just being multicellular, oh, now we have developed tissues. And one of the first things um, is going to be a nerve net. So they're actually going to get more of a nervous system. So this phylum would include uh, jellyfish, um, sea anemones, so not uh, Nemo, but the thing he would live around and in, and then coral, so coral reefs. All right, so Nidaria, they have radial symmetry body plans. Um, they've got one opening into and out of their basically stomach, so what comes in, they have to basically poop back out the same way, so that's not great imagery, right? They've got two body forms, polyps medusas, and they actually have a nerve net. So now we're starting to add a little more complexity. Uh, this is what I meant before by symmetry. So this is like radial symmetry. Any way you cut them, they would all be like a perfect side. We're realize like we humans are only like bilateral symmetry. You can really only cut us like down between the eyes, right? And left and right should look the same, at least on the outside. Um, so this is a new type of symmetry. So mouth, tentacles, there's the mouth, we'll get there. Um, that's actually where the jellyfish will feed. So here's another optional one if you want to watch, some giant jellyfish. All these stinging tentacles will bring in the food to the mouth right here uh, on the inside. So this is kind of just the back end of it. Um, so it does have a quote-unquote nervous system, pretty basic nerve cells arranged in kind of like a nerve net, so you can kind of see the beginning of a nervous system, but no like centralized brain, so that'll come later. We'll look at that. Um, again, they have two main body types. They have a polyp form and a medusa form, so this you can kind of think of like the sea anemone, and then this form looks more like the jellyfish, but all of them will live in both of these forms. It just might be in different parts of their life cycle. So sea anemones, this might be like their main adult body plan, but when they reproduce, they will pop off and make tiny little medusa forms. Whereas a jellyfish, most of its life it will spend in the medusa stage and very little of its life in like a polyp stage. So as you see, here's two jellyfish. They are mating. Uh, sperm and egg make a zygotes. They will initially start a new colony as little polyps, and then very quickly these will develop and out pop the medusa buds, and that will bring that. So what part of the stage do they spend most of their life in? It's a kind of cool look at. Look at all these terms I'm not making you memorize. So there's lots of different types of uh, jellyfish out there. Some of them can be ginormous, 70 meters in length. That is huge. Put that into yards, and that is a ginormous jellyfish. Um, but coral, we really want to see coral and have these in my classroom, right? We think of just like the outside, the calcium carbonate, this kind of like quote-unquote exoskeleton, the mineral material. But the actual animal is inside. It's in the polyp stage, and it retracts when it's not feeding, so they hide inside of here. So they like make basically their own shells that they live in. So the polyps will pop out, like these guys when it's time to feed. So it's like a whole, a coral reef would be like a whole interconnected colony, colony of these things. And they go back inside to hide um, so nothing comes by and tries to uh, eat them. But they do have like little stingers um, uh, to trap and like paralyze prey as it's coming, coming too close. 
So coral reefs form over thousands of years. We've talked about this before um, at the very beginning of the year, so I'm going to spend too much time. But high species diversity, high biomass, this is why they're very important to keep protected. Um, lots of baby fish will basically go through their maturation process around coral reefs. Um, so if we want to keep eating big fish, uh, big fish, we want the little ones to have a safe area to actually grow up in and survive. So here's another cool optional video, uh, video coral 101. So we've knocked out two phylum. You can kind of see a little bit progression. Now we've got a nervous system. These are all going to be worms, so we're going to knock out those real quick, and then hopefully we get to these two in this video. So uh, Platyhelmys, um, the first phylum of worms. These are flatworms. You've seen these before. These are the ones you can kind of like cut in half, and sometimes they'll grow back depending on the species of them. Um, they have eye spots, so now we're starting to get things that can see, and an excretory system. So nervous excretory system. Now we're starting to get eyes, so you can kind of see a little progression of evolution. Um, but they're pretty basic still. Nematodes would be another phylum. These are roundworms. Um, so a lot of these are parasites. So this is obviously, this is a heartworm and a dog. So this is why you want to make sure your dog is getting its pills. Um, they have both a mouth and an anus. They are pseudocelomates, and many of them obviously are parasites. Um, so unlike, so here's our excretory system, unlike just having food come in one, uh, the mouth and have to go back out of the mouth, and now we actually have a pretty smart digestive system. Uh, this term right here, coelom, refers to um, its like digestive system. Um, basically, we are coelomates. We are tubes within a tube, if you think about it, from your mouth to your anus. When you eat food, food doesn't actually um, coincide your body until it actually breaks down and passes through your small intestine lining into your body. Because if it doesn't, it just goes from mouth to the anus and out. So it's not really technically inside or part of your body. So acelomates, this is all about is there a body cavity around it? So when you like cut into a human, we all have these kind of cavities where all our organs in. Um, so they don't have that. You could cut through this and it'd be like cutting through jello would all be continuous. Pseudocelomates start to have kind of of a little body cavity, but it's not until we get to annelids that we actually have, these guys have a true body cavity. So that's why we can actually do dissections with earthworms. You can see the kind of body cavity. Um, these guys have the true tube within a tube body pattern. This is the reproductive part right here. Um, so and they have a segmented body, so everything is uh, a lot more organized. So these are kind of very advanced worms compared to the other ones. And they have a circulatory system. So look at all the different systems, body plans we've been adding up. And just worms. Worms uh, got us moving pretty pretty far down the evolutionary tree. All right, so here's a, if you haven't been watching any of the optional videos, you definitely want to check out this one. This one's really gross. It's with leeches. Um, there's a lot of cool information in here about um, where we got like um, anesthesia, things like that, how we um, figured out how to dilute blood because like leeches and organisms do that. So this is a really interesting video. Check out that one. Um, all right, so we're moving on here, moving on up. We now have bilateral or radio symmetry, bilateral symmetry. We have finally developed a true coelom, so a body cavity. So we've knocked out these. Now we're going to quick knock out arthropods and mollusks. So we're starting off with mollusks. Mollusks are like basically clams, um, bivalves are as one class, but it also includes things like our gastropods, so snails, things like our cephalopods, so squid and octopi, and here's the nautilus. Um, so most of them have a shell, a little protective thing they make, or they have lost it. So um, things like a squid have like the vestigial shells, if you remember the term vestigial. Um, same thing with an octopi. Um, you can think of slugs as well compared to snails. They've like lost the sh uh, shell over time because nature selected for that. Oh man, it's not doing the gif. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so octopi are real cool. They can have, they can do tons of different things. Um, there's going to be another video popping up to check out those. Um, but in all, if we look at these two uh, groups, these two phylum, arthropods and mollusks, look how many species they represent out of all the species of uh, in the animal kingdom. So they are a huge chunk. They're probably the most successful chunk of species out there. So mollusks, to stick with them, again, this would be the second biggest group. Uh, there's a ton of them. They have a soft body. Most have a shell or they've lost it, um, mostly in seawater, but obviously snails and stuff like that can be terrestrial. Um, they have a coelom. They have an open circulatory system, which I'll show you in a second. Um, a lot of them are filter feeders like clams or the bivalves. They burrow. It's kind of cool to see. If you've never seen it, how uh, clams and uh, scallops and things like that actually feed filter feeders. They have an in and an out, which is nice, right? You don't want it to be the same tube for in and out. Um, they can be 500 pounds. You guys have played that old school Donkey Kong. I always remember you have to like swim through the clams while they're going up and down. 
Um, so yeah, there's lots of them. I'll just keep going. It's kind of cool to check out the body plans of a lot of these creatures. You know, you'd probably rather have this one. You wouldn't really want to have this body plan where you're pooping on top of your head. And that's also where your gills are. So that's maybe not the smartest body plan. Uh, here's the cephalopods. Um, so these are the ones where their uh, shells are vestigial absence. They have an ink sac. So we use, well, we hopefully we'll see in May uh, if we can do the squid dissection, but you can basically dissect them out and um, write your name uh, with their um, vestigial shell and the ink sac, which is really cool. Um, so it looks like we're going to have to stop here, and I will pick this back up with uh, insects.